Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I'm glad you're brave, Bill. I even brushed my teeth and washed my face this morning. Thank you for sitting close. <laughs> Let's pray. Gracious God, still our hearts and minds that we might hear what you have to say to us today in word and song and sacrament. Amen. Today we read probably one of the most familiar stories in the Gospel of John, this nighttime conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. It also includes a passage that's recognized far beyond the boundaries of Christianity, or at least the citation is. John 3.16, how many of you have seen it in on TV shows with ball games and stuff, or at least 316. We know what that means. Folks that are not Christian know what that refers to. Martin Luther called John 16 the heart of the Bible, the gospel in miniature. And most of us can probably recite it. So here's your test. Say it with me. For, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We all read different translations, don't we? Uh, you know, in our lives, we like a sense of order, don't we? We like to know what comes first, what's next, and what's next. We, uh, we like to have things in its place. Some of us like to have everything in its place more than others. <laughs> Sorry, Brenda. Um, we like rules and regulations, guidelines, procedures. They're kind of, procedures are nice and important, especially when we're worried about cold and flu and not passing COVID-19 or other things around. Nicodemus probably really liked order as well. You see, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. That was one of the major religious leadership groups among the Jews. The Pharisees were the religious attorneys, if you will. They studied, discussed, debated how to interpret the written law, the Torah, and how to keep it relevant with current social and, 
and uh, cultural situations to keep it up to date. And they collected all those laws and teachings and debates into what's uh, known, I think, as the Talmud. And the Pharisees, they valued teaching. They valued interpretation. They valued order, and it gave rise to the synagogues out in the villages. The Sadducees weren't out in the villages because they dealt with sacrifice, and so it was only in the temple that the Sadducees had anything to do. So the Pharisees' interpretations and the teachings back then even lay the groundwork for uh, modern-day Jewish religious practice. There's still no temple, remember. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He sought knowledge and order in his faith. And his culture was firmly rooted in the Torah and Talmud. Now he comes with a background that's a training that he's open to debate. He's open to questions and he's open to learning to keep order within his religious community. So he comes to Jesus. He kind of slips in at night, right? He come, does that because Jesus is already a controversial rabbi. I mean, already we're in the third chapter of John and Jesus says, turn water to wine and overturned the tables of the merchants in the temple and driven them out. That really upset the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So fearful yet curious, Nicodemus secretly visits Jesus. And I think Nicodemus comes because he's really sincere about gaining knowledge about Jesus. I think he's curious about the order for life that's communicated in Jesus' teachings and that's revealed in his miracles. However, we learn and see that Nicodemus is not quite ready to make that leap of faith from being a Pharisee in the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious council composed of Pharisees and Sadducees, to being a disciple of Jesus. New life, Jesus tells him, is under the reign of God with that gift of faith. It's a work of God's Spirit. And that Spirit is not at the beck and whim of humans. We can't decide when or where to be born anew into God's kingdom. It's God's gracious work through the Spirit that brings us into life as a child of God. Living in God's kingdom. A kingdom that begins now on earth and that we are a part of by God's grace. Faith an active verb as it's used throughout the Gospel of John, beckoned Nicodemus to a new life. Kept nudging and nagging at him, but he wasn't quite ready for that nudge at that moment. He does come back later in the Gospel of John. I think that Nicodemus' hesitation as he slips away, disappears from the conversation, from the story, is clear and that faith is clear and importance of faith in the familiar verse we recited earlier and the verse right after it for John so loved the world for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life and then Jesus continued indeed God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. God's purpose is salvation, redemption, reconciliation. The Greek word in this, these two verses that's translated as world, world is the Greek word cosmos. We know the transliterated English word cosmos. It refers to all of the created universe. Now as technology and astronomical physics has advanced, we are learning just how vast the cosmos, the universe is. I heard an interview recently with the woman who is a leading researcher in the SETI project. You know, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The movie a few years ago Jodie Foster starred in was about it, searching for, for extraterrestrial intelligence. And this researcher said, taking into account 50 years of research that they've gathered, the vast array of those huge radio telescopes aimed out into space and all the 
data that computers have crunched, she said, the universe is so vast that to date, the, the amount of space we have searched for signs of intelligent life is comparable to searching the ocean with one glass of, one 12 ounce glass of water so far in your search for the ocean to see if there's any fish in it or not. That's a vast universe. So to think of cosmos as only this world is way too limiting. So Jesus is announcing that the free gift of salvation, the free gift of forgiveness, is given by God to the entirety of God's creation. Nobody and no element of creation is outside beyond God's love and God's desire to sweep them or it up into God's kingdom. Restore it to a right relationship with God. This is an amazing announcement by Jesus. We learn that God through Christ has covered the cost of salvation for us. We learn that contrary to the boundaries, conditions, and limits so often erected by human religions from our own perspective, for our own benefit, Nicodemus was doing this with the Pharisees too, that contrary to those boundaries and limits we establish, God longs, yearns for, and wants every person, indeed every cell, every atom to exist, within and under God's gracious reign. And yeah, that includes people that some Christians might exclude. People that are from different cultures, have a different language, people who are LGBTQ+, or different Christian groups even, because they're the not, not the right kind of Christians. They don't read the Bible the same. And yes, God's grace includes even people who may call God by a different name. I'm not willing to limit God's grace. But there is another meaning for the Greek word cosmos. Indeed, you know that dictionaries list the uh, most common, most important definition is the first definition, right? So in my Greek lexicon, the first definition listed under cosmos is order. Order. So we could read John 3.16 and 3.17. Let me get the words in front of me so I'll get it right. For God so loved the created order that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the, the son into the created order to condemn the world, but in order that the order, God's good order, might be saved through him. Jesus is linking God's grace not to our human concepts, not to the visible creation necessarily, but to the order, created order of creation that God spoke into being back in Genesis and that God each day in that account announced as good. See, the same Greek word, cosmos, it's used about the order that God spoke into being, bringing order out of chaos you remember that story, the earth was without form and void and, the, and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. Waters and darkness symbolize chaos, lack of order. And God speaks and order comes forth. So God, so we might read and understand John 3, 16 and 17, proclaiming that through God's work in Jesus, the entire order of creation, as God created it and proclaimed it good, is being restored. In the beginning, God's created order had no sin. God's created order in the beginning had no broken relationships between people or between people and God. It had no pollution no conflicting religious views, no crime. The order of the cosmos was in perfect relationship with God and one another. It's an amazing announcement. It upended the exclusionary concepts of order that Nicodemus and the Pharisees debated. 
And so he slips away to ponder it. It was just too much to take in. But he'll be back later in the gospel. And still today, we humans, we continue to argue about the correct and the right order for human society today. From our human viewpoint, we have ideas about how the world should be ordered, what's right and what's not right and so forth. The challenge, it seems to me, is confessing that our ideas, our human abilities to restore the good order that God created in the beginning are not perfect. While at the same time, grasping that faith in Christ compels us to continue working patiently, faithfully, persistently to move our imperfect human order toward and closer to God's perfect created order. We're not there. Never be there this side of Christ returning probably. But we cannot stop trying faithfully. For this is the essence, I think, of loving God and loving our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. I think social statements and the policies of our church, the ELCA, may help illustrate this, at least in my understanding. Just two quick examples. The social statement that was adopted last year at the churchwide assembly, Faith, Sexism, and Justice, acknowledges that men have exerted control in ways that have not treated women equitably as fellow children of God. It doesn't correct those inequities, those sins from the past, but it commits and calls us as a church to do better treating women and girls as fellow children of God. The apology to the African Americans during the assembly acknowledged ways that the church has benefited from slavery in our nation and how we have not always acted well to support our African American siblings. Confession is the first step toward changing, becoming better. We're not there, may never get there, but we set that out to grow toward. We also acknowledged our, and recognized and renewed our 25-year-old apology to our Jewish siblings for the writings of Martin Luther that were very anti-Semitic, that were used uh, by the Nazis and promised to do better, to work together more faithfully. Even though these and whatever else are our best efforts, they will fall short. But I see them as faithful efforts to move us closer, to move us toward God's good created order that includes abundant life and grace for all people and all of creation. Here at Grace, get a little more local, are we not also working for a, a better, more just, more equitable community when we serve with the variety of local agencies? I mean, Hot Dogs and Hugs encourages and shows grace and compassion toward families of incarcerated people in our community. The Habitat Houses give families a secure and safe home, one where the plumbing works and the sewers connected. And they know will be, the kids know will be there when they return home. Safe Light strives to heal the wounds of domestic violence and return victims to wholeness. Thrive labors diligently to have their, their clients, their participants, return to productive involvement in, in work and in the community. All of these and more, including the work of our Justice and Advocacy Ministry, looking at the causes and addressing those and so forth, endeavor to move our current culture closer to the order of God's kingdom. So what's that kingdom look like? I'll just send you back to read the Sermon on the Mount. That's the best place I see it. In Matthew 5 through 7. But faith, faith given by the Spirit Faith, an active verb throughout the Gospel of John. Faith calls us to a new life, working toward, working for that creative order 
that good created order of God, a new life that Nicodemus wasn't quite ready to accept right then. Are we able to move from the bondage of this world's broken order toward and into the gracious, freeing, life-giving order of God's kingdom here and now to be a part of that being arriving as we pray for in the Lord's Prayer? Today we'll celebrate the sacrament of holy baptism at 11.15 service for Annie and Aidan. God will gift them with the Holy Spirit so that they might grow in faith and share in this work of bringing God's order to this world. We, as a community of faith, will make a commitment to pray for Annie and Aiden to help nurture and teach them the faith and encourage them as they grow and have courage and persistence and patience to do that work of faith, love of God, love of neighbor, for God's good order. Faith is a gift offered to all people all creation, and indeed, to the immense universe in which we live. It comes from above, from someone who loves everything and everyone, someone whose only son died for the love of God's created order. Faith is believing and trusting in something so fervently, so fervently and deeply, I think, that we are motivated to act on it. This belief guides, directs, even compels our actions, our choices to diligently, patiently, persistently continue to work to help God's good order for creation be made manifest and restored now. So faith calls us to action. Faith calls us to live within and to extend God's good created order. How is your faith calling you? to respond. Amen.